Oh, here's here's paper. All right. Since I can't share my screen, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw on pieces of paper and hold it up to the camera. How's that sound to everybody? All right. Here we go. I'll just do it like this. Tip mouse. Hot. Tips. I had little videos to show and everything, but this is how I'm going to do it. Tip mouse hot tips. <laughs> All right. Woo. Yeah. Streaming. Here we go. All right. So I'm Chris P. This is a stream of sorts. Uh, I didn't even clean up my studio because I didn't think I was going to be streaming uh, my my uh, my actual video. I thought I was just going to be screen sharing. So uh, you're getting to see my actual behind the scenes uh, quarantine studio. Look at that. Uh, there's a painting I'm working on. Uh, anyway, so here I'm going to I'm going to this thing is going to focus on storyboarding, right? It's storyboarding. So check it out. These hot tips. Hot tips. Storyboarding. Reboarding. So this is mostly like when you are like sending in work for review. All right, so we're going to focus on storyboarding in this stream. And it's basically going to be like, hey, you want to get a gig as a storyboard artist? People, directors, showrunners, they're looking at what you send in. And these are some tips on what you want or more specifically what you don't want to do in your storyboards. It's also for review by directors when they're looking at your work. And... Some of this stuff has been covered in other storyboard stuff. Some of it absolutely has not. So, you know, I can go over. Actually, you know what? Maybe I'll look since this is interactive and I can see the chat on the side. Um, do you guys want to hear like basics? Do you want to be basics? Oh, wait, I have a question about writing. Do writers and storyboard artists work closely together? Depends on the gig. If it's a board-driven show, absolutely. Uh, the, the board artists are kind of like the writers. And in some shows, like a, like a, a, sh a show we're doing now, uh, Mau Mau, the second season, a lot of the board artists were writers in the writer's room and are also board artists. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so we're going to skip basics. We're going to skip um, 180 rule. I don't have to go over 180 rule. Right. That's uh, yeah, that's one you guys all know. All right. We'll go into the secrets uh, right on. Oh, cover letters, emails. Yeah, man. Uh, cover letters. I don't know. Cover letters. I don't think they're super important. I do a cover drawing. If, if you want to get somebody's attention, uh, pretty much people skip the cover letter. I think they get right to the work. You know, you have to understand when people are submitting for a job right like we're starting up a new show and we're we're you know putting out the feelers for board artists and you know the director the supervising director is probably going to look at stuff first they're oh you've been scolded for cover drawings well they're just boring people who uh don't don't have joy in their lives for drawing that is my assessment um anyway so, uh, oh yeah, that's my, I had to make a tip mouse logo hat because, uh, for doing interviews and stuff. Um, oh, here we go. Hey, you know what? This might be good. How about this? I'm just going to refer to the chat for now and answer some questions and I'll get to some secrets. Um, if you want to work as a TV storyboard artist, sure. Do your portfolio have super cinematic shots or, or keep it more streamlined? I like cinematic shots. If you could do cinematic shots, you could probably do simpler stuff. Um, oh, yeah, we could do a stream for animators at some point. Yeah, uh, I think this will all be up after the live, too. Um, I think it's good to know cinematic stuff. A really good tip for storyboarding is watching movies, not just animated movies, live action movies, and sitting there with a book like this. And, you know, just thumbnail and stuff you see, like you're like, and it doesn't have to be like fancy 
thumbnails. It can be like the simplest, the simplest drawings ever. You know, you're going to see how bad these thumbnails are, you know, and if you just like shot for shot thumbnail out what's happening in a movie, it's a really good thing uh, for, uh, for just learning visual storytelling. Uh, so that is a great way to just learn. If you, we will do one for design. Antonio's going to do one for design at some point too. Um, I'm focusing on boards because that's how I came up. I, I started as a storyboard revisionist back in the nineties and uh, it was a great way to come up when you're fixing everybody else's boards. I think it's one of the best ways to come up in animation. Um, the, uh, the uh, you, you fix everybody else's mistakes, all your, storyboard heroes who you idolize uh you hear them get ripped apart by <laughs> the directors and you're like oh i thought that storyboard looked awesome but then you learn like oh there are some things yeah you could pause the movie to thumbnail uh especially if it if it's if it uh if it's a real uh fast cutting movie um uh oh how many stories should your storyboard portfolio have you know you want to keep it short i keep getting distracted i'm not going to look at the chat for a second all right, let's go back to what, you know, what people are looking at. I'll go back to the cover letter thing uh, for a second. So you, you're submitting some boards, right, for a gig. Uh, the supervising director, the show creator, they're looking at possibly hundreds of these. They're not going to read the cover letter first. They're going to look at the work first. And if the work is good, maybe they'll go back and look at the cover letter. I think it's all about the work. And I would make it a goal to have the least amount of work in there that shows your skills off the best. You don't have to you don't have to board an entire episode. You don't have to you just have to do enough that gives them the idea that you can do the gig. Now, one thing that's happened recently or not even recently in the last like 10 years, I'd say in animation is there's a lot more poses in storyboards. If you're working as a board artist on a show, because we're cutting animatics now to send to networks, there's a lot more weight on the board artist to draw a lot more poses. Now, thankfully we're drawing digitally where we can copy and paste and it's possible to do more poses than it used to be in the, in the pen and in paper days. But, um, uh, for a portfolio, I wouldn't necessarily board the way you would board for an animatic because it's going to be a lot of panels to click through, uh, for acting. If you're going to compile them into a video, maybe that it shows you, you could do a bunch of acting poses. Um, the, um, the, but when there's a lot of panels on the same shot for acting, it, it gets hard to, to just like go through as a board. Um, so, uh, anyway, let me get back on topic. I'm going to, I'm going to more specifically look at these questions. All right. Let me see. I'm going to go to, where am I here? How rough can the storyboards be? Okay. Uh, that depends on the show. If you're, you know, some shows, some like, uh, like adult, you know, animated shows or that are shipped overseas that are mostly like based on dialogue jokes, uh, and the animators are just going off model sheets. Uh, those are generally more tight. Like if you're going to do like a family guy type, you know, show, those are, those are generally really tight because the boards are essentially the layouts. If it's a more cartoony show and it's something that, you know, animators are going to interpret, um, I think it can be looser. Uh, anything that, that ships uh, with sheets is going to have to be tighter than stuff with a local team. Uh, anything that ships without sheets to like a kind of trusted animation studio can be uh, can be looser. I'm when I say sheets, I mean exposure sheets, which is like the antiquated way to put timing uh, on paper, which is still used uh, and hopefully will you know eventually we'll get a better system than that but um i like rough boards i always ask when i'm directing a show and i work with board artists i always ask for them to submit the roughest boards they are comfortable submitting if it tells the story that's all i need to know and we can like if you have a, a section of a a board right it, it depends on if you're uh if it's a board driven show 
it will take longer than this. But if you're working on a script driven show, I would, I would hand out, let's say, let's say we're handing out a, a 22 minute show to three board artists. Right. And you've got, you know, four weeks for your first pass. Right. So each of you is getting an act, you know, if it's a 30 page script or so you're getting 10 pages each. Uh, I advocate to thumbnail the whole thing out in the first day or two, you know, just the first vomit out of your head, uh, thumbnail drawings as loose as possible and uh, run them by your director because then you just get immediate feedback. You don't go way down a path that you don't need to go down. And uh, any director should be able to read like a really loose thumbnail. Uh, that's what I prefer. And then you're not two or three weeks in showing a pass that's really, really worked out. And then it's like, oh, you know what? Could you stage that entirely differently? And then you end up with... Uh, you know, having to redo a bunch of work that you spent a lot of pencil mileage on, I would say rougher, the better, um, until it's ready to ship. Um, anyway, let me go down to some other questions. Um, to do, to do, ah, another question. Is it best to look for jobs on the tip mouse website or try networking with people who work for your studio? You should use everything at your disposal, uh, when you're looking for a job. You know, it's uh, this light box is a great thing when it was, you know, when it was in the physical meat world, uh, it was a lot easier because you could wander around and you could actually meet people virtually. It's a little bit tougher, but, um, you know, going to parties, uh, you know, being active in forums and chat rooms and whatever kind of communities, even Twitter is pretty good for it. Instagram's pretty good. Weirdly enough, I don't see as much on Tumblr. I, these days I abandoned my Tumblr account a couple of years ago. Um, the, uh, it is absolutely, I gotta say, if you applied for a job on our tip mouse site last week, we were updating our website. It is up now again. So if you got a bounce back or you got some weird, thing where it wouldn't complete now it's up again so there's a new we just updated our website there's a new jobs or a new careers section so you can apply again but that is for us specifically the best way to get your work seen um if you submit stuff to the website and also keep emailing sales nothing nothing happens if you email sales or media or one of those other things uh all it does it gets deleted nobody's looking at that the producers Every anytime there's a job posting, it's because we're looking for people in those jobs and it goes to the producers. That stuff absolutely gets seen. I know sometimes it can feel like you're sending stuff out in the void and no one's getting back to you. We're, we try. We try. It's hard to get back to everybody. There's just such with a worldwide pool of artists. Uh, there's such an incredible amount of incoming work that we see that it's hard to to get back to everybody every time. So I apologize if you're not getting feedback and you've submitted stuff, but do know that people look at the stuff that you submit on the website. All right, let me look at this next one. Uh, happy death. Uh, would it be possible for me to qualify to work at Titmouse, even though my resume is mostly my personal projects? I'm creating and I've never worked at a studio before. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, the cool thing about the animation industry is that it is not, you know what? I guess this is going to be about whatever. I like this. This is less work for me. I'm just going to reply to questions on the chat. Maybe I'll draw some stuff and show it to you later. But uh, who needs the storyboard curriculum? I'm going to answer questions of what is the actual, your actual <laughs> desires of uh, what you want to know. Um, so yeah, uh, the cool thing about the animation industry is you really don't need a degree. You don't need any kind of formal training. I liken it, uh, the entertainment industry in general, I think in, in the creative fields, right, in animation, and I don't mean just being an animator in any artistic or creative aspect of the animation industry, right? Like uh, if you're talking about writing, if you're talking about animation, if you're talking about design, if you're talking about voice acting, it's all about your talent and your skill um the uh i'd liken it a lot to like professional sports or something right like if you were a you know if you are you know playing street basketball every day for hours a day and you get really good you can possibly you know audition and get on the lakers uh you know or try out 
I'm not a sports guy. But uh, anyway, the uh, uh, if you go to if you're a college basketball player, maybe you've got a couple of more lines in. Like if you go to a fancy art school like Cal Arts or SVA or Sheridan or whatever, um, maybe you get a couple of more hookups. Um, but it doesn't matter your degree, your what you what you end up with on that piece of paper at the end of the day doesn't matter. It's only the work that you put into it. So if you work really hard and make really good work, you make a short film or you do some really good portfolio work, that's your ticket. Um, so school, no, it doesn't matter. You can, I think doing is the best way. If you treat this uh, animation career as seriously as people treat, you know, like, you know, if you are going to, if you want to, you know, become a professional, like violin player or a professional, you know, sports, uh, you know, athlete, you know, if you want to practice, you know, four hours a day at least, and you should love to draw and want to do it all the time because that's what you're signing up for. Um, so that was a long rambling answer. Let me go down to some of these other questions. Oh, all right. So, uh, how many stories should my storyboard portfolio have? Um, you don't need a lot. Um, I'm going to go into design a little bit because it's an easier way to address this. And I'll go back to storyboards, uh, for a design portfolio, I would say you should have the, the perfect amount of pieces is 15, right? And you want to have like two or three life drawings, a couple of, you know, designy things. And this goes for if you're going for character design or background or paint or color or whatever. Um, and if I would be as hard and as harsh on those pieces as you possibly can. And if you can get friends to critique you or teachers or whatever, anyone, the internet to critique you and beat it down, I'd rather see a portfolio with 10 really good pieces than 15 mediocre ones or even 10 really good ones and five mediocre ones definitely don't want to see 20 mediocre ones like the more less is more with this stuff for sure people are busy and here's the thing you're going to get judged on the worst piece in your portfolio not the best so it's like people are looking at the best and they're looking for reasons to to question this uh you know your your directors or your art directors they want to have confidence in their team and they're like okay oh you know what? The first 10 pieces looked really good. And then I saw a weirdly drawn hand and that other one, do they really know how to draw hands? Then they're going to go back and scrutinize your work and be like, they're always hiding the hands or they're always holding a pole in a weird way. And, with, and that one hand that's holding a coffee cup doesn't really look like the way that you hold a coffee cup. Um, so less is more. And that goes with boards too. Um, it's, it's much harder to have a general portfolio for boards i would say do some research on what you're applying for if it is just storyboard artist which i know sometimes it is if you're applying through a website it's harder um i'd say show if you can show one kind of more actiony realistic -y board and two comedy forward boards and i'd the con it, it, I'd play to your strengths. If you're a comedy person and you're a cartoony person, then you know, then then just go with that. Don't try to force yourself into doing actiony stuff. If you're an actiony person, you know, show the actiony stuff. The actiony stuff, uh, I think is gonna. They're both gonna have to have um good draftsmanship or at least solid draftsmanship. Um, I'll, I'll get to one of my little hot tips after this. Uh, uh, you just want solid drawing. You don't need to have fancy drawing or detailed drawing in the action stuff you're going to want to show an understanding of the camera more you know the cartoonier the show the less you truly have to understand the camera it's more about gags and poses and acting and cartooniness um but uh for for action stuff it, it doesn't hurt to show that the cartoony stuff by the way the live action or not the live action but the action stuff like if you're going for like a you know like a you know a true action show something you're going to want to show a lot of uh understanding of camera understanding of how the camera moves understanding of lenses you know when you're setting up a shot is this a long lens or a wide lens shot you're going to want to show uh more anatomy and draftsmanship some fight choreography things like that are important uh to show in those kind of things. So 
I'd say like three boards and like keep them sure. I'm trying to think of how many panels. I mean, like <sighs> people are going to, I don't think there's any advantage in showing too much because if it shows too much and it's not your strongest work, it's just going to give somebody a reason to turn you down. If you don't have a lot of panels and your work is great, it gives them a reason to contact you because they want to see more. So I'd say leave them wanting more, right? Don't try to convince them with a volume of drawings how good you are. Show as little as possible of your strongest work. And like, I mean... 100 panels on a board is way more than enough. Uh, that's, that's, you probably can go for less. Um, all right. Anyway, uh, question. I heard character animators have been turned into board artists because of outsourcing. What happens with the people that still want to just be character animators? Yeah, you know, that's, uh, you're not, entirely wrong at tip mouse we still try to do a lot of anima animation in-house it's not as easy as it always is uh, as it used to be uh, when we we're a younger studio as you get bigger you become more of a real corporation and and uh you know i'm happy to say you know almost all of our productions are union at this point and you know it's uh in, in the la studio um the uh vancouver still has a lot of a, a big animation pool it is it's a worldwide it's a worldwide pool now. So we do do a lot of short form projects, commercials, uh, things like that. Midnight gospel that we did with Netflix. Uh, we were able to, uh, you know, to, to animate that in house. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard. I gotta say, it's not usual these days in the States to do 2d character animation. If it's not a short form commercial or a very simple, like puppeted, uh, you know, show like a Harmony puppet show or a, a animate formerly Flash puppet show. Um, uh, if you're looking to do like, like, you know, tr so-called traditional or tradigital, as some people call it, uh, animation, it's the states. It, it, it is harder. Uh, so what happens with the people that still want to be character animators? You know, I think it's good to to, to be good in multi disciplines. Uh, in case there's not always animation work. Um, and a storyboard artist is not the only path to director. A lot of animators in our studio have made it to director. So that's another another way you could do it. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I think that was rambling. Hopefully, hopefully that <laughs> somewhat answered part of your question. I don't know. All right, anyway, I've been told that your networking skills and or social media presence is just as necessary, if not more so than your portfolio, would you agree? Um, I'd agree for the first contact. Uh, I think your social media presence is good for getting you noticed and getting you in the door, but then you've got to have the goods to back it up. The... You know, I think it is more necessary than your portfolio because I will look at somebody's Instagram and that's all I need to know. Like that's their portfolio, basically. And I would suggest this is important for the social media, right? Make a separate Instagram for your art and don't have like pictures of you getting drunk with your friends on there. I mean, not that I don't want to see pictures of you uh, with your cat or with your friends or whatever of your cool car. Um, it's just, it's just, uh, then you just have to weed through that stuff to get to the art. Um, if you have one, that's all your art too. That's another one. Uh, you know, cause some people they're like share their friends art or, or whatever. Um, if you have one that's like, sure, like, like very specifically job focused, it's like, Hey, this is, this is my art that I want someone to look at for, you know, assessing my ability. The other thing that's good, like when you're presenting a portfolio, that's when you got to have like your 10 or 15 strongest pieces, right? But your Instagram is a lot more forgiving. I'm not going to judge you on every piece in your Instagram because it's like, hey, you're putting stuff up, whatever, especially if it's like loose drawings or ideas and stuff. So it's a good way to show a bigger breadth of your work without being judged as harshly for it. So, all right. Uh, Again, you're mostly speaking as a writer. Important to work on my drawing skills. Be write and storyboard in the future. Um, it can't hurt to draw. I, I 
I think it's a really good skill. Um, I mean, if you're looking at solely being a writer, write every day. If you're looking at solely being an artist, draw every day, but do both if you want to write and draw. And boarding is kind of like writing and drawing or doing comic strips. I see a lot of people, uh, you know, doing doing comics like uh, a project I'm directing now. One of the one of the board artists is a is a you know does comic strips. He posts them on Twitter pretty much every day, and it's great. Uh, it's really good. It, it really made a difference when, uh, my, uh, the guy who we hired to be the head of story on this project, uh, recommended them. And I was like, Oh yeah, I know that guy. Not only did he intern at Tim Mouse years ago, but I, I follow his comic on, uh, Twitter and it's really funny. So we want a funny board guy. So there you go. It just keeps, 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 uh, keeps you in people's minds post frequently enough to get people in, my, in there. All right. So anyway, I got off of the the topic but yeah just write all the time just write if you get bored of writing it might not be the right gig all right for you anyway question how can foreigners work on networking uh well i mean twitter and instagram you can post from whatever country you want and you know the uh a good chunk of the animation industry communicates in english i see that you're writing a question in english so if you're uh able to communicate in english and you can get on these you know there's also like facebook groups and you know all sorts of forums and you know i i I think the world is a lot smaller especially unfortunately because of the pandemic nobody likes that there's a pandemic but the one upside for animation is uh it doesn't matter as much where you are it used to be like hey you're trying to get in as a board artist in LA you've got to be as good or better as any board artist in LA and also live in LA now you just have to be as good or better as any board artist in LA you don't have to live there we're hiring we're hiring uh hiring every everybody from everywhere right now okay uh let's see Question, do you have any tips on showing depth in storyboards? Does adding value help? I've been told my boards look flat. Hmm. That's an interesting one. I'd be curious to know like what exactly about them looks flat. Depth is, you know, maybe this is, all right, here. This is a hot tip. I'm going to give you a hot tip. This is one I've been using for years, and it's called, I'm writing it down. I was going to do this all with graphics but whatever something i call lipstick on the pig right lipstick on the pig is no amount of detail or shading or extra lines or lens flares or soft focus is going to make your drawing your underlying draftsmanship or your clarity of your boards better so i would not use value as a crutch to show depth in storyboards i would work on your staging i would work on your clarity of your poses i would make sure to avoid tangents i would make sure that you understand what lens you're using as a you know for your camera you know uh if you there's a lot of there's a lot of just look up like lenses in cinematography and storyboarding there's so much so much material about that online but you know it's like if you think outside of the frame i mean that's one of the things that that is often it's a it's a rookie mistake with board artists of drawing your characters too low in the frame as if they were in a hole you know and if you only drew out and and kind of used a perspective grid on the floor you'd realize like oh if that guy's head is there then that means that they are like from the waist down underground um so i would just i would just uh try to do it in the drawing if you could do it in the drawing you uh you won't need the shading uh the shading's good for mood and things but uh you can also be speedier if you don't have to do as much value in shading um all right. So how good do your drawing skills need to be? Well, they need to be pretty good. What I can say is, uh, you know, not everybody has to be the best draftsman, but you have to be pretty darn solid. Uh, you can't like, 
unless you're like if you're working on an entirely like board driven show where you're writing a lot of gags and you are the funniest writer your gags are the most innovative funny gags you can get away with not being a very good draftsman you still got to be pretty good i i think boards you got you got to be a pretty good drafts person it's just the way it is so just keep drawing i mean this is uh you know if you're in school or you're out of school i mean pandemic time now it people have a lot more time i try and fill up those sketchbooks just draw 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 all the time draw while you're doing other stuff keep a sketchbook doodle while you're watching netflix or whatever um you know if you can draw four hours a day you will become a good draft person <laughs> draw your cat or your dog all right i'm gonna scroll down a little bit uh let's see uh oh here we go hmm all right <laughs> here's here's an interesting one all right i uh Someone asked, uh, I made a penis animation loop that I am weirdly proud of. Would something like that be all right to include in a reel for Titmouse, or is that too edgy? You know, I know we do a lot of adult shows, and it's, you know, and we're considered, you know, oh, we do crazy edgy stuff, but the only way I'd include something like that, it better be the best animation that you've ever done, or that it, there's got to be a real reason. I, 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 I why risk offending somebody? You know, I don't think people aren't looking to be impressed by edginess in a real, they're looking for the quality of the animation. So if you can have animation, that's just as good without a, you know, penis animation loop, I'd go for that because why, if, if someone does get offended, then you're, then you're edging yourself out of a job. You know, if, if you can if you can make it the easiest for yourself to get a job that's better why put up obstacles um and uh you know am i saying that i would be offended not necessarily but um you know who knows you don't know you, you don't get to curate who's who's looking at your uh reel um all right uh let's see what else oh all right yeah check it out can you explain the difference between background design and layout? Some studios uh, treat them the same, but it seems like Titmouse designed these in two jobs and wondering what's expected from each job's portfolio. We d it depends on the, the show, right? Because sometimes we do treat them as the same and sometimes we don't. If we are doing a show within... Well, first I'll tell you what the difference is, right? The design is the design, right? That's like, what does it look like? What does a door look like in this room? What does a table look like? What does my incredibly dirty floor <laughs> look like in this room, right? Uh, that's the design, but it's not the angle. It's not the shot. The layout is the actual shot that's going to be used to place the characters if there's characters in the shot. But it's, it's the drawing that's going to be painted and used on screen for the, for the, the project, right? So... That's the difference between the two, right? Now, if you're doing a shipping show, which a lot of shows in the States do or, or Europe do, and they, they'll, they'll ship to another uh, uh, studio, uh, you'll do designs. A lot of times you'll do a shoebox design for a room, which is like kind of looking down and you'll see all the walls or you'll see some details. And that's just like, here's where everything is. Here's what it looks like. Here's the technique of how to draw it, right? Um, and it's very unlikely that layouts are done unless they're for like a one-off shot. It's like, hey, this is the shot and the design. There's no reason to redraw it. Uh, if we're doing a show in-house, a lot of times we'll combine those jobs because there's not going to be a layout team somewhere else doing it. Uh, if we're doing it within, you know, our three locations, you know, our, our New York, LA, and, and Vancouver, sometimes we'll, uh, we'll, you know, combine that. And uh, the art director is often on the ground with the with the background artists, um, you know, and th those lines blur, right? There used to be a very distinct uh, difference between the background drawing and the background painting. And with digital, sometimes that's blurred too. Sometimes a lot of background artists that are not the painters will add tones and things to drawings just because it helps them sort it out. And, uh, and it's, it's just uh, different than it used to be. Hopefully that works. Um, 
Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm going to scroll down a little more. Um, all right. I'm going to go to the bottom and work my way up now. So I don't favor all the other questions. Okay. Any advice or hot tips for a 3D animation reel? Hmm. I mean, we don't hire a lot of 3D animators. We only currently are doing like pre-production, pre and post-production on 3D shows. Uh, my 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 advice when I've looked at 3D, we've done some commercials and some short form 3D. So when we looked at that stuff, it's just it's it's very similar. It's the quality of the animation. It's the animation acting. You don't have to go fancy unless you're applying for lighting or texturing or modeling or rigging. But if you're just doing animation, it's just you just gotta you know you just gotta have good animation. It could be on a very simple model. It doesn't have to be good. I would I would actually say the less fancy the model, the less fancy the rendering, and the more is just about the animation. If you're applying to be an animator, then just make it about the animation. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. I've heard prop design is a good entry level position to pursue. Um, prop design can be. Um, I have to say, uh, on larger productions, there's usually a prop designer. On smaller productions, it's it's usually the first thing that gets cut and it gets handled. You know, depending on on what it is. If it's a car, it'll get handled by a background artist. If it's a pencil, it'll get handled by a, a character artist. But prop design is good. Prop design is though you got to be pretty technical. Um, you know, there's less. You know, I, I got to say our our our. Uh, our chief creative officer, Antonio Canobio, is is really uh, prop focused. I think a lot of times props get underserviced in in shows, but props can really add to the depth and comedy of a show, and it's something that a lot of Japanese studios do really, really well. I mean, look at look at like how food is rendered in a typical uh, you know states uh, Hollywood show versus uh, you know uh, Japanese uh, anime and you'll see like uh, you know props are handled uh, much more specifically generally to generalize uh, and French self as well and uh, uh, Antonio our, our, our creative officer is French and I think he he really digs into props so if you're applying for a job that Antonio is looking at the props uh, it may not <laughs> you may not be able to get away with the the entry level stuff it's uh, you better be able to really draw a car well um so yeah uh but in general i think props are a good entry level position um all right let's see what else oh any advice for pitch meetings um yeah keep it short and keep it focused uh you really your outward pitch should be 10 minutes if you have an hour meeting your first uh your first 15 minutes is going to be waiting, right? You're going to be waiting somewhere. I mean, this is all pandemic aside. You know, this is if you're going to pitch somebody live, but it, it still kind of applies uh, for different reasons. Your first 15 minutes is going to be waiting in the lobby or waiting in a conference room for somebody to get set up. They'll give you some water or something like that. Then your next five minutes or so, maybe more, will be what I call the bullshitting part, which is getting to know the person, talking small talk, talking about the fires, talking about whatever is going on, you know, talking about uh, maybe a little bit of your history, some some work that you'd like that, that it's never bad to compliment the work of the studio or the network that you're pitching to. Then you'll get into the pitch. I think it's very good to clearly delineate when you start your pitch. I like to do it by clapping my hands after you're done. And it's like, and you, you're like, yeah, all right, great. I'm glad you had a great time at your kid's birthday uh, last weekend. So now I'm going to pitch you a show called, and then you get into your pitch. And then it's very clear that you've started your pitch because I've seen pitches kind of fall down when the person pitch doesn't realize that the pitch has started, which is a weird thing to say. Then you basically have 10 minutes to pitch. Then you've got 15 to, you know, I don't know, 25 minutes for Q and a afterwards. If they have no questions, probably means you, you they didn't like your pitch and you should get out as soon as possible if they have a few pointed questions answer them and then also get out as soon as possible and here's what i'd say to you want to get out of the pitch meeting 15 minutes before the scheduled end of the meeting don't linger if it's clear that they didn't like your pitch get out 
be friendly and they'll be ready to take another pitch for you. And they won't be like, Oh, that person stayed for so long after I turned their pitch down. Uh, if it went well and they want to continue the conversation, also get out. Don't give them a reason to say no. Um, because everybody has to check their emails or go use the restroom or make a phone call before their next meeting. And that person, that development person will f- appreciate that 15 minutes they got back from their schedule. Um, all right, let's see. Um, let's see. How you bowl is it to be more of a generalist jack of all trades in smaller studios? I've heard specialize is, is essential for bigger studios. Is that the same for smaller studios? I think it's great to be a generalist jack of all trades in general. The more you know about what the other departments do on a show, the better artist you will be in general. The better you will know how to execute your job in a way that is helpful to every aspect of the production. Now, it can never hurt to be really good at one thing and then be also so be good at other stuff. Um, when I came up in New York, you had to be, uh, you had to be a generalist. Like I was, when I was in New York, I worked at MTV Animation in the mid, uh, mid to late '90s. Right, I was there from '94 to '99. And I worked on Beavis and Butthead and Daria. I had a show there called Downtown. Worked on a bunch of uh, station IDs, commercials, pilots. Um, I would do design. I would do boards. I directed. Um, and then on the side, New York had a big, a bustling commercials uh, industry. So I would animate on commercials as a freelancer. So that's how I got my animation chops. And I got to say, animating, doing animation is a great way to get good at, at posing in storyboards, especially to somebody's point in one of these questions that uh, nowadays uh, there's a lot more posing in boards than there used to be uh, that uh, you, you just you're at you're you're doing key poses now. It's really just the way the way it is. So the more you can understand that, the better. I remember um, Yvette Kaplan, who was the supervising director on Beavis and Butthead. Uh, I remember the first board I did for Beavis and Butthead. They they get up from the couch and they walk over and they have to answer the door. Uh, I can't remember what it was, but um, she was like, "Oh my God, thank you for." thinking about how they open the door and i was like what do you mean and she's like what do you she's like you're an animator right and i was like yeah I do, yeah that's what i do freelance and she's like yeah i could tell because you made them step back to open the door a lot of people who haven't animated will have their hand on the doorknob and then they'll have the door open and they don't understand that the door would have had to go through their body in order to open the door. So uh, just think, it, and doing animation, I think, helps you think about boards. Also helps you be efficient. You know, if you've had ever had to animate a crowd scene, if you've ever had to animate people walking and talking while they're walking in perspective downstairs, it'll make you think about how many of those shots you put into your boards. Uh, so, you know, uh, I think it's always good to be a generalist. It's always good to learn about the other aspects of of the field but it's also good to get really good at one thing too um all right so um canadian american dual citizen trained in u.s considering returning to canada for work um to us international presence advice for those looking to break into canada's art scene um well uh we're always hiring i mean vancouver there's a huge boom in animation now and we're hiring in our Vancouver studio all the time as is every other studio in Vancouver. Um, and there's other cities too, you know, Toronto and Montreal and Ottawa are all really good at, uh, uh, Halifax and Nova Scotia even has really good tax credits. Uh, there's folks that there's a lot of work in Canada. Uh, I don't think you are, I think it's, if you, especially if you want to do animation, if you if you're looking to, to be an animator specifically, there are infinitely more jobs in Canada than there are in the U.S. for animators, uh, for background layout, for uh, character layout, for compositing. 
as you get further into pre-production, there's less of those jobs, but there there are becoming more of those jobs. We're definitely doing more pre-production in Vancouver than we had uh, when we first opened, considerably more. Um, all right, let's see. What's this next one? Question. Any specific periods of time or months that you guys are usually hiring for new animators or story artists, Richard? Nah, there is no season, really. Uh, it's just when shows get greenlit. And, and, and the frustrating thing is it's like there's like you're always waiting, waiting, waiting. You, you, you sell a show and then you're waiting to see if they'll greenlight it to pilot and then you make a pilot and then you're waiting to see if they greenlight it to series and you may wait months and months and months and months. And then they're like, okay, it's greenlight. Go, 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 go. And then it's like, all right, we got to staff up this show in three weeks. So it's like, there's generally like a long, like waiting, waiting, waiting periods. And then a mad rush to hire stuff. And I wish the industry wasn't like that, but that's generally how it is. And uh, that's why it's good to have your ear to the ground with other animators and, you know, be on whatever message boards you prefer, or even Twitter is a good source of, you know, I do see now other artists and I think it's a good practice to have other artists, uh, you know, on a show say like, Hey, the show that I'm on is looking for board artists or looking for designers or whatever. Here's how you can apply. Because if you are an artist on that show, you want to have other good artists to, to, to help you. Nobody wants to be carrying somebody on their crew. Crews are smaller than they used to be. In the 90s, we had so many people on a show because uh, we're all drawn on pieces of paper. And, and it, was, it was harder in a lot of ways to technically make a show. Now crews are pretty small and uh, everybody's got to be really good. So uh, I'd look at people saying like, hey, we're looking for people. Uh, Except for, I would say that 11 a.m. June 15th is also a good time. That's a joke from the chat. Um, all right. Anyway, whoa, a bunch of more questions. Um, to, oh, this is this is a good one for just general housekeeping. Does Titmouse offer internships without being enrolled in college? Um, we don't, unfortunately, and that has to do with with the law and insurance and rules and being a real company um it's just uh that we would have to have a lot more expensive insurance and go through a lot more uh process to have um interns that aren't in college at least in our u.s studio i know that we had started an intern uh an intern program in vancouver recently before the pandemic but you know the pandemic kind of screwed up the internships i think if if i'm not sure what our position is i'll have to check on on pandemic internships in the beginning we halted it because it seemed unfair to the interns because they weren't really getting a true experience but now that it's going on so long maybe this is the real experience of what it's like to work in a studio and we may be starting it up again um so anyway uh blah 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 um, before the pandemic, if someone who applied to Titmouse qualified for a job and they lived outside of LA, do you give them time to relocate to LA? Um, it, that depends on the circumstances. If there is time, I mean, generally there's a, uh, there is a schedule for the show and there's start dates for the positions. So if a person you know, if we were to consider someone outside of LA who needed to then work in LA, uh, they would just have to get there uh, before the the job started. Uh, there's some exceptions, like uh, if if somebody's like, "Hey, I need a month to pack up. Can I do my first two weeks remotely or something?" We would always consider that kind of stuff. But um, you know, we can't give generally tons of time the further down the line your job is like if you're somebody on the tail end like a compositor or something there's generally more time but boards are are the first boards and design are the first up usually so there's not as much time for that oh <laughs> how's vox machina coming along uh we are we are all crewed up for that and we have been for a while and it's coming along great i just saw something really really good on that yesterday that i can't talk about but um i think if you are a critter and hopefully if you're not a critter 
uh, you will not be disappointed in that show. It is firing on all cylinders. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. Well, there are so many questions. Um, okay, there's a lot of internship ones. What did I cover already? Um, does someone without a degree have a chance of getting hired? Yeah, definitely. I think I covered that a little bit. You don't need a degree at all. Um, I think here, here's the thing I'll tell you. Uh, I taught for uh, intro to animation at School of Visual Arts for one year uh, before I moved out to L.A. And I'll tell you what I told the, the students when they started uh, on the first day. And this is it. If you are going to this school primarily to get a job, and that is your only reason, you should drop out today and save yourself a bunch of money and network with people and just take cheap, you know, there's all these like life drawing classes that you can pay like 25 bucks and draw all night or whatever. Um, you don't need to pay money just to get that degree. That is ridiculous. Um, don't do it. But if you want to go to school to learn and grow as an artist and be with like-minded people and be in an environment where you delay getting a job to focus on yourself and get better at your craft. That's what the school is. I saw so many people when I was in school and when I was an instructor that treated art school like a party and didn't take it seriously and didn't get better, didn't progress as a work and art, you know, instructors in art schools, they're not really harsh. They're not going to fail you. You'll pass. You might even pass with good grades. And then you're asked out because you're like, I got good grades and I got a diploma, but then you can't get a job. If you work really hard and get really good, uh, it doesn't matter if you have a degree or not. Now, really good art schools have great instructors and usually have very good like-minded students that will challenge each other and make each other better. I work with a lot of people I went to school with. I went to school of visual arts. I graduated in 1994. So many people that I know are, are in high positions in the animation industry. Uh, I, I, I recommend uh, going to any kind of those schools if you can afford it. Um, what I wouldn't do is overextend yourself. Uh, try and find ways to not uh, be overburdened with student loans. Uh, I could not afford to go to SVA without uh, loans and scholarships. I uh, got student loans and then my I, I applied for scholarships, did not get them. And then my mom, who, uh, if anybody remember Seinfeld, you guys like Seinfeld, the show Seinfeld from the 90s, 80s, 90s. Um, my mom is kind of like George Costanza's mom from Seinfeld kind of like New Jersey uh, can get very loud and, and grating. And she basically just browbeat, got on the phone and browbeat uh, the chairperson of film into uh, giving, giving me a scholarship. Uh, so I was lucky to have uh, a New Jersey bulldog of a mom. So uh, yeah, anyway, uh, you can uh, maybe, uh, I, I guess my point is, uh, you know, there are ways uh, try if somebody says no, keep trying. Uh, yeah. All right. Another question. So where, how can I find storyboard tests for Titmouse or other studios? Ah, tests. Tests. Everybody hates tests. I hate tests. Tests. I would not seek out storyboard tests. Uh, sometimes you have to do a test. I had to do tests for my first few jobs Everybody will end up doing tests. At Tim Mouse, sometimes we do give out tests. I am not a huge fan of them. Some showrunners are. Uh, I, if you want to see tests and practice on them, I guess that's fine. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, I wouldn't, you know, I don't know. I don't know where you find storyboard tests. I, I wouldn't give out this. It's always failed for me. Whenever people I, I've thought I've gone through this, this I'm, you're seeing me in real time, psychologically work out, uh, an issue that I'm torn on, uh, the, uh, 
these tests, you know, I've had young artists ask me for tests and then I, I will give them a test and I'll be like, this is not for a job, this job, you know, if you want to just have a test to see what it's like and do a test, then I'll submit a test. And then even though it's stated that it's not for a job, sometimes there's an expectation that it might lead to a job and everything, everybody judges them differently. I think it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough for a storyboard driven show. It makes a little bit more sense. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't look, don't look and try to find tests. <laughs> I, would, I would, I would say, uh, just, just try and draw really, really well and, and keep practicing your boards. Uh, and if you have to do a test and you might have to do a test on a tip mouth show, because some people, if you haven't worked with, with them before and your work doesn't show it, they will need some barometer. Um, it's unfortunate that that's the way it works. Um, Oh, look at this question. What's your day to day like? Oh, look at this. Somebody wants to quickly thank me for answering all these questions. Um, and they're excited for Mad Mouth second season. It's going to be great. It's going to be even better. Um, yeah, this is not at all what I thought I was going to do. I thought I was going to share my screen, but I think this is cool. Um, so anyway, uh, I was about to, uh, answer somebody else's question and it got bumped. Uh, whoa, I lost it. All right. Sorry. I'm just going to answer a different one. Uh, let's see. Do you pin Oh, how do you pinpoint what you want to do if your school makes you a generalist artist? I'm a senior coming out of college and I feel I only have basic knowledge of different positions in the industry. It's tough. I mean, it's really these art schools, the art schools are best, I think, in my opinion, at teaching you really solid foundation art. Like the most you can get out of your art school is like become a excellent drafts person, you know, be able to draw from life really well, be able to draw anatomy really well, maybe be able to paint really well. And if you get a good teacher who's focused, uh, maybe you'll get some animation knowledge or some specific storyboard knowledge or whatever, you know, animation centric knowledge, but it changes so often and everybody's got so many different opinions and methods. It's hard. I think when I went to SVA, it was much less structured but it was a cool environment and I had a lot of kind of like hippie beatnik kind of advertising teachers that I loved and were really cool, but they were basically like experiment. Here's all the equipment. Here's some basics. Just go do it. And I think pit pointing what you want to do is about figuring out what you want to do. So do try doing a bunch of stuff, make a film, make a short film. You have, everybody's got now the capability to do that on the, even on their phone these days it's crazy how much exists that didn't exist when i was coming up so make a film see what you like see what you hate see what you think is tedious um if you don't like drawing all the animation poses don't go for being an animator if you love painting the backgrounds go for being a background painter and dig into that and and become good at that hopefully you worked on a film if you're a senior coming out of college uh and you've learned what you like i would say dig into that uh all right oh how often do y'all hire someone over 30 who is switching careers um you know i don't know how often we do that but there is certainly no like reason not to i mean the great thing about the animation industry as opposed to you know other things is uh i find that people's skills often just keep improving as they get older so it's not like a a a you know a job that that requires you know it's like well you know now that you're really old you can't climb up on a ladder anymore or you can't you know you don't have the reflexes to drive that forklift anymore or whatever it's a trade that as long as your eye and your hand communicate with each other uh you there's no 30 over 30 over 40 over 70 is fine if 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 uh if you're just good you know <laughs> i would just say uh you know just practice all the time and if you if you're passionate enough to switch your career you're you're probably you know 
the right candidate for getting hired. Uh, I would just say, are you drawing four hours a day? If not, start doing it. Um, all right. Well, we're getting to the point where we're, I think, probably around an hour because we started late. Um, maybe uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll answer like two more of these and then I'll split. All right. So uh, what percent of board artists, revisionists are hired through online apps as opposed to networking? Hmm. Well, it depends on what you mean online apps. 